My name's Joey Clark. I'm an ecologist and science communicator. I've spent a fair bit of time in the Kimberley uh, and I've met many of you at various sanctuaries around the country. Now though, I work mostly in communications with the development team in Sydney. And I'd like to take this point to acknowledge that I work and live on Gadigal country in Sydney. Well, coming, us, coming to us from Charnley River Station is Toby Barton and our team of fire practitioners. Uh, it's now just after 11.30 on the East Coast, but they're a couple of hours behind. So we've actually just caught the team before they head out for burning today. Toby, do you want to introduce the team that you've got up there at Charnley? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Joey. Um, so next to me here, I've got Luke Russ. Luke Russ is the Willigan, um, I guess. Fire Ops and Biodiversity Officer. So, yeah. so Luke, he's been training this year as part of the partnership with AWC to essentially take over the navigation and uh, fire ops role for Willigan in partnership with AWC. And then Jonas Klein, who's been with AWC for three or four years now, sorry. Three years. Three years. <laughs> and been doing the fire work before this in Arnhem Land uh, for 10 years or something. Or something like that. Something like that, yeah. So they're about to head off for the day. So I just wanted everyone to at least meet these two before they disappear because Really, I'm just the fat controller and these guys do all the work. So it's more important that they get recognised than me. Well, we're glad we caught you, Luke and Jonas. Um, do you want to show us the, the rain dance machine that you've got there um, and just describe how that works briefly before you, before you head off? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, maybe I'll just stick it in the way. So. Right. So we'll, we'll talk through the operation of this later, but um, essentially that's the machine you use to deploy incendiaries, that strip that Luke is holding up into the landscape, the little capsules which are injected with a chemical um, and then they ignite after they've left the helicopter. Well, that's the plan, isn't it? Yeah, um, so yeah, this goes, do you have that photo? You're able to put up that photo quickly? Yeah. Okay, or is that? Yeah. Um, it goes in the passenger seat of the helicopter. We have a navigator in the front seat and then someone who's sort of managing this machine in the back seat. Right. And we drop around three to 8,000 incendiaries out of it every day. So anyway, we can get stuck, talk about that a bit more. Yeah, okay. As we get into this talk. So yeah. you should now be able to see how that rain dance machine fits into the helicopter. Um, so that's, I just thought we'd show you that before the team takes off, but that's what uh, you guys will be out doing today. All right. Well, All right. Um, thanks guys. Thanks for joining us and um, have a good day out burning. Thanks so guys. Thank you. Bye. All right, now Toby, you've been with AWC for eight years in various positions. Um, you were yep, also correct. operations manager in the Kimberley based at Mornington. Um, and you've got a lot of experience now doing this sort of fire work. Can you describe to us where you are right now and what the setup has been there at Charnley for the last few weeks of, of lockdown? Right now I'm um, actually in the Charnley manager's house because we have no internet anywhere else. But uh, we, we, we came out here, I think it was eight weeks ago now, now at least seven and a half weeks ago. We came out uh, just as the coronavirus was sort of kicking in into gear and sort of all the lockdown was becoming apparent. And, and you can see on this map at the moment, we cover 6.5 million hectares, about the same size as Tassie. Um, and so moving across the Kimberley with helicopters like we do, it left us in a position where we may expose people if we caught coronavirus or if we, um, if we, we caught it from someone who had it. So we came to Charnley and we isolated with a core team of people, about 14 people, which included Dumbing Mangari and Willigan uh, people to come out to Charnley to do the fire program this year. Right. And we've been, yep, sorry. So, so basically you took the decision to isolate to prevent that spread of coronavirus or, or, or at least limit the risk of um, transmitting it throughout the Kimberley because you're covering such a big area. Um, you know, I guess that was a very real risk. So what has that meant for the operation of, of the program there? Um, well, we've so, we're sort of, I guess we're about 80% done now, but we've spent the same amount of money and time on the program that we would have 
and we would have finished in a year where we weren't operating like we are out of Charnley. So we're spending, you know, up to three or four hours extra in the helicopter a day because we're flying from the homestead here to the site where we need to burn and then returning back to the homestead. So yeah. our costs have gone up a, a considerable amount. Um, it's been, that's mainly been the big negative, but the big positive has been that because people like Luke and the Umbi team have only left two days ago, they've got exposure like never before to this program. So a couple of people have now sort of come up to a point where they're much more independent in the delivery of the program, probably in future years. Right. Which is a really nice outcome, you know, in creating independence with our partners is sort of what we're all about. So. Yeah. Great. And, and how does it work practically? Like you're there, what, it's about eight hours drive from Broome. Um, how are you able to keep up supplies of fresh food, all importantly, to toilet paper, that sort of thing? Well, uh, we're really thankful for the Mornington camp because they had a ridiculous amount of toilet paper already in stock. So that wasn't too much of a problem. But right. um, we, we've been getting most of our fresh food supplies on the mail plane. So every Tuesday, we get an order from, uh, from town and that gives us the greens that we need. Uh, we're able to get the odd feral cow. Uh, and we've also built a big veggie garden. And, and logistically, it's been a bit complicated because trying not to interact with people, bringing stuff from town has been uh, difficult. So we've been getting things dropped off at a river about an hour away and we go down and pick it up 24 hours later usually. Mm -hmm. So, but it's all been possible. We haven't not, we haven't wanted for anything really. We've been quite spoiled. In fact, I had to start taking myself for a walk twice a day because I was eating too well, so. Good to hear. Um, <laughs> the focus for today is about fire management, of course. Um, I'll just say for Always anyone who's joined in the last few minutes, uh, please feel free to ask questions as we go along by using the chat function. So that's at the bottom of the screen. Um, over the last, well, at AWC for the last couple of weeks through these conversations, we've talked about the destructive impact of fire in the southeast, in tall eucalypt forests. But in Northern Australia, there's a very different attitude to fire. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about why it's different in the north? Sure. Um, well, I guess if you just draw a line uh, across half of Australia and go north, other than the east coast, most of that country is savanna or subtropics or tropics, which means there's a much higher biomass and, and typically will burn once every two years. If lightning starts a fire, it'll burn once every two years. So um, the kind of history of fire programs across the North is uh, different in different places, depending on what's being done. Pastoralism had its own intent. Uh, Aboriginal people have their, had their own intent, but it's sort of a part of the fabric of the North. People don't, uh, people participate in fire on a yearly basis. So everyone, you know, you'll be in broom sometimes and people will be burning their front yard as a way of landscaping instead of what we know from down South. So it's, it's just a part of the fabric of living in the North of Australia. Right, so it's, it's a part of the landscape. It's part of how ecosystems work in Northern Australia. Um, you mentioned there's that the long and continuing history of uh, indigenous fire management and we're we're grateful to be working with Willigan Aboriginal Corporation and Dumpy Mungyari Aboriginal Corporation to deliver fire across um, a large part of the Kimberley now. Can you just describe what happens if there's no fire management? So what if there's no one going out and applying fire to the landscape at the right time of year? What happens then? All right so well it, I guess it if you, if you look back around the time that the fire program started for AWC in the Kimberley, which was about 2005, um, what people were seeing then was uh, pastoralists typically have a, an asset, their grass, and they're trying to protect their grass. And then any, anything outside of that, they're just lighting up to make sure that fires don't come in. But so they're sort of protecting the flats and then burning the hill. But what was happening is that all the bits that weren't managed in any way would just burn every second year. So a lightning strike, for instance, would happen in the north. A fire would travel the whole distance of the Kimberley. Let's just focus on the Kimberley, come down to the bottom of the Kimberley. And then the next year, all the parts of the Kimberley that didn't burn would burn out 
in a in a wildfire the next year. So that was why this fire program initially started. Is we we knew that generally late season fires were bad, and the best way to change to change the way that fire activity was happening in the Kimberley was to actually participate in managing fire. So using uh, solid breaks and mosaic pattern work and uh, uh, protecting assets on the ground with ground burning, whether it's around sensitive ecological habitats or infrastructure or roadsides. But then what we do complementing those things is we have the aerial program, which is where we're flying around with a helicopter we're doing. I think I said to you before, Joe, I think we've done 36,000 kilometres this year and yeah. we've dropped 200 and 250,000 of these incendiaries. Yeah. So... Just um, yes. I just wanted to um, show people what those big hot fires uh, late in the dry season look like. So this is a, a little snippet of footage uh, taken, I think, from Mornington a few years ago. And this is the sort of fire that burns in, say, September or October. So this is long after the wet season. Everything's dried out. There's a lot of fuel on the ground. And you can see that that's an extremely uh, intense burn. It's not leaving any vegetation untouched, so it's not it's not burning in a patchy way. It's very thorough, um, and as you said, these fires at that time of year can cover a million hectares easily, or several million hectares. Um, so that's really what happens in the absence of active fire management. Um, what what's the difference between that and how fire behaves at this time of year? Um. Well, quite simply, it doesn't look like that at all. So essentially, you have really cool fires, as most people refer to them, um, and and they're just burning through the landscape, mainly taking out the grass cover underneath. Hot fires, like you're seeing there, are taking out everything. So they're taking out the treetops, they're taking out any scrubs, uh, any shrubs, like sort of decimating the landscape. Whereas a cool fire, there you go, as you can see with Jason here, the Mornington uh, operations manager. They're just quite a cool fire that burns out a lot of the vegetation, but doesn't, uh, sorry, doesn't burn out all the vegetation, only burns out part of the vegetation, which creates refuges inside the uh, fire scars for native wildlife. And it also, it also acts later on in the year as a fire break for the late season wildfires that you saw before. So we'll have a look in a bit at, um, at the software and the spatial imagery that we use to kind of dissect the landscape and protect different areas to prevent those large season hot fires happening. Yeah, this is um, some of that targeted ground-based burning that was done at Mornington uh, a month, or just over a month ago. Um, and you can see even after that fire has gone through, there's still a lot of vegetation left on the ground. And that's extremely relevant if you're a small mammal, like a native rodent or a little marsupial, um, or some of the ground-dwelling birds. So it means that there's still food resources available, there's still shelter, um, and we've demonstrated through work at Mornington that that gives you a much, chance of, uh, much better chance of hiding from a feral cat, which we know are significant predators. Um, and we know that the benefits of this sort of early season burning uh, are reflected in what we see in our monitoring of small mammals. So we've seen an increase over the long term as these fire regimes have improved and as we've uh, reduced the incidence of those big hot fires later in the dry season. Yep. All right, so um, there are different ways of measuring fires. So we do a lot of that work using the mapping software that you'll, you'll show us in a minute. So you can look at the size of the burns, how intensely or how hot they burn, how thorough they burn. One of the really important ones is how frequently one area burn. So one of the objectives of this work is to try and increase the distribution of patches that haven't burned for three years or five years or, or longer. Um, so there's all sorts of mapping work that we can do using satellites and, and other technology to look at how things are changing and then to try and find correlations between that and what we're seeing with wildlife um, and vegetation. Um, just wanted to mention too that as well as benefits for biodiversity, uh, there's the co-benefit of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So obviously after one of these low intensity burns, they're not putting up so much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. 
and we're able to measure that by looking at the organic matter that's left on the ground. So through just a part of the Kimberley burning program on our Ecofire properties, so that's AWC sanctuaries and some pastoral properties that are neighbours, uh, we reduce emissions or we avoid emissions of 75,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. That's kind of too big to, to get your head around, but it's equivalent to taking 18,000 cars off the road. So that's a, a co-benefit where, you know, we're doing it for preservation of wildlife and looking after habitats and keeping ecosystems functioning. Um, but a co-benefit is this uh, reduction in carbon emissions through this sort of biomanagement. All right. Um, so Toby, we might come to AWC's approach to fire management and what we're trying to do yep. in the Kimberley. Um, do you want to share your screen with us and, and talk us through what you're looking for in the landscape and how you plan burns each year uh, based on that satellite information that you've got available? Okay. Um, so, can you guys all see that okay? Can you see that okay? I'll, I'll speak for all 100 participants and say, yes, we can all see it okay. Okay, so this is our Kimberley Fire Program. Um, uh, most of you will be familiar with this area. Uh, we have Broome down here in the bottom left of the screen. And Kununurra is in the top right. We get your bearings. Now, this is the whole project area for AWC. So, and and um, Dumbi Mangari and Willigan. So, it's six point. I think it's six point three million hectares in total. And, and what I wanted to show you was uh, how we uh, plan and then implement our fire program. So uh, this is our current or our, our original fire plan for the season. So we sit down with all our partners, be it pastoral neighbours who are a part of EcoFire or the Indigenous Partnerships and Defence as well. And we come up with a plan that, with the idea of trying to dissect as much as the old fuel in the landscape without burning it all out. So we do that by using satellite imagery. So on the right hand side on this list here, you can see I have fire scars and then I've got one year old fire scars, two year old fire scars broken up into early season fires. So what we're doing now and late season fires, what happens later in the year. And this is three year old fire scars. So I'll turn them on and then we'll go and zoom in and look at one example. So Toby, is this information that's come from looking at fire scars at the time and then that data is stored? Or is there a way of telling it from the satellite that you know this last burnt six years ago, five years ago? So we use a service from an organisation that's been in the media a fair bit recently. They're called um, NAFI. They're out of Charles Darwin University and they offer a free service of satellite mapping fire scars. So they take a picture, which I'll show you in a moment, and they turn it into a shape, and then you know how big that shape is and where it is in the world. So we, we can define where our fire scars have been historically, and then we use that information, one-year-old fuel, two-year-old fuel, three-year-old fuel, and older. We, 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 we'll just simplify it today rather than looking at older fuel because we know that roughly three-year-old plus, we just categorise that as one for today's sake, but that has a high value for the native mammals that we're trying to uh, increase in the landscape here. So um, this is Charnley. This is where we're based at the moment. We're in the homestead, which is down right at the bottom here. And if you've ever seen any spectacular footage of Charnley, it's all from this section up here in the, in the, in the northwest of the property. This is the Charnley River that borders the property. So, this is how the state of fires looked uh, at the start of this year. So the red is last year, the yellow and lighter, darker yellow are um, 2018, two year old, and green is three year old fuel. So you can see that a lot of our lines are drawn through the greener and yellow colors. So we're trying to break up the property as best we can to sort of compartmentalize all those fuel loads. So, this year we've come up with a really interesting uh, use for the satellite imagery. AWC's team has been uh, 
downloading satellite imagery direct from a satellite called Sentinel. And, and it gets made into this image here, which is a black and white image that gives us about 20 meters resolution. So if I just flick those fire scars back on now, the black and white, uh, the black and white patches, there's some white patches down here. They are the fire scars as they are in the landscape. So if you look at our lines that we planned at the start of the year, you can see that we've got a pretty good outcome here on Charnley. So we've got lots of lines that sort of cut up all the old fuel areas that hopefully will mean on an area, let's pick a patch like here. That if a fire started inside this patch, we may have to do a few little bits of fire suppression up here. We might have to drop some teams in with, um, with some leaf blowers and water backpacks to fill in this gap here and fill in this gap here. But otherwise, it's unlikely that this fire would be able to spread out of that little compartment. So we're trying to do that as best we can across the whole area to essentially reduce the risk of any late season wildfire spreading into a large fire that takes out a huge amount of country. And also to make sure that if it starts there, we have a lot of options in terms of suppressing the fire with teams, helicopter based teams. Right. That's, um, that's really impressive and especially just seeing the alignment of you know those uh, the green lines where you wanted to burn um, and with what you've actually achieved there um, it's a, a really close fit so congratulations um, I might I'll just show you one more thing before we go off this I'll just put up our incendiary lines so our incendiary lines are those um little uh, capsules that I showed you earlier that go in the in the helicopter, in the machine, in the helicopter, and we have a data logger that is able to show you exactly where they hit the ground. And so that's, I think on Charnley we've dropped 30,000 incendiaries. So this is every individual incendiary that we've dropped over the course of say two months. Sorry, Jay, I'm just interrupting. No, I no, might no. go back out to the overview too, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Because we'll just talk about the total amount of work that we've done this year. So I'll remove our fire plan and I'll show you every single flight that we've done so far. So we've covered uh, just under 40,000 kilometres now, I think 38,000 kilometres, and we've dropped 250,000 incendiaries. We've probably got another three weeks' work ahead of us. You can tell where Charnley is because everything's centred around Charnley. This is on the left, this single line coming in from the south west is our one trip from Derby. <laughs> and we haven't left since. <laughs> so yeah, that's an overview of the whole area. So it, it, you can see that there's large areas where there's no fire scars on the ground. And the reason for that is because those areas burnt last year. So the red, it's a little bit difficult to see, but um, they all were either extensively or accidentally burnt in the late season. So wildfire season took out large areas, so we haven't been able to get much fire in the landscape there. That's a, a really good illustration of the scale of the work that you're doing. You said it's nearly 40,000 kilometres flown in the helicopter to deliver this work. And I did a quick back of the envelope calculation. That's right. <laughs> almost the same as flying the entire equator. So you've flown around the world just to do this fire management in the Kimberley. Um, as you said, that comes with substantial costs. So, you know, it's something that does cost money, but this is the single most important tool that we've got for improving the ecological health at a landscape scale. Um, so, you know, if we, if we don't get fire right, it sets us way back in our, our mission to try and, you know, provide effective conservation for wildlife in the region. Now, I'll just remind listeners that you can ask a question by uh, choosing the chat function at the bottom of the screen. We might actually go to some questions now. Toby, do you want to just um, stop sharing your screen there and we'll address some of these questions? Yep. Um, all right, just one second. All right, we've got a question from Jenny Farrell. 
and I might just get Jenny Farrell to ask directly so that everyone can hear. Um, Jenny will just unmute you. All right. Uh, Jenny, you should be unmuted now. So would you like to ask the question? Oh, okay. Thanks, guys. It's all very interesting. Hey, Jenny. Uh, we were doing some travel across the Tanami Desert uh, where the native grasses were being overtaken with buffalo grass. Um, yeah. The cool burns work really well with the native grasses, but when buffalo grass burns, it burns really hot and out of control. Um, how do you deal with this in, with your burning? Are you seeing a lot of buffalo grass up there? And when it overtakes the bush, have you got a plan for burning when buffalo grass is taking over? Thanks, Jenny. Um, Luckily, in the Kimberley, this central part inside the King Leopold Ranges, there's actually very little buffalo grass. Um, a lot of the heavily grazed areas down in the Fitzroy Valley and towards the Pilbara have actually seeded lots of buffalo, but it really hasn't taken a footprint up here. Um, I can't really speak for buffalo, but we've had a similar issue with, um, with greater grass, which is like kangaroo grass from the East Coast, I guess but I think it's from India originally. And one of the issues with that is it really likes disturbance. So it grows under trees, it dies off earlier, and then it, and then it has a higher biomass than normal grass. And when you light it, it, burn, it has such a large amount of fuel underneath the tree that it takes out the canopy. So one of the only ways we've been able to deal with that in terms of the fire program is you just have to light up earlier than you normally would so that you don't get such a high biomass, but it is actually a really big problem. We've done a lot of control work over the years with um, spraying and trying to take it out, but it, it's a very difficult one. It's mainly just adjusting the time that you burn. Thanks, Toby. Um, we've had a couple of people asking about how we're incorporating indigenous knowledge of fire management into the delivery of our prescribed burning program. Um, I'm sure everyone would, would be interested to hear about that. Do you want to talk about that briefly? Yeah, sure. So I guess uh, one of the ways I always look at uh, the similarities between AWC's fire program and Indigenous uh, fire practices is that uh, one of the things that changed over the period of time between uh, Aboriginal people burning and white fellas burning, I guess, is that pastoralism came into the mix and pastoralism really only at the time, we're talking in the last hundred years, wanted to protect the asset of grass. So they were burning in a defensive way to stop, uh, to stop fires coming in and taking out their grass, which would affect their cattle and their bottom line. But one of the ways that I see a big similarity in what AWC is doing is Aboriginal people would go out and they would burn for reasons that I don't really know. I can assume some things, you know, maybe to propagate uh, better food sources or to clear areas or um, to ensure that they would bring in animals on green pick, for instance. So it was sort of this systematic long-term knowledge of like figuring out how to do something and then doing it for a sort of predetermined intent. You know, you want to increase food, you want to do that. Whereas AWC is sort of similar in that they saw problems with like the Gordian finch decline or the, 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 the height of predation of cats on native animals. And so we looked at ways to modify our fire regimes to prevent those things uh, having a detrimental effect on native wildlife. So I guess the intent is the same, but in the end, we're flying around in helicopters where, where um, dropping in sendries and we're using spatial imagery. So the way we're doing it is a little bit cruder to, what, to, to having people spread out across the landscape and lighting little individual fires everywhere. Um, but that said, we now have really great partnerships with Willigan and Dumby and their teams, unfortunately only got to meet Luke, but there was a few other rangers who've been out here for seven weeks with us too, have been like really 
playing a lead role now in the fire program up here. So they're, I, I wish they were here to kind of speak to this question rather than me, but they're sort of taking what they've learned from their, their elders over the, their life and they're out there practicing fire management with us. Thanks, Toby. Um, we've had a, a couple of questions come in too about um, carbon credits and whether, you know, because we're averting greenhouse gas emissions through doing this early dry season burning, whether that generates an income. Um, I can say that it certainly does. And um, for the partnership projects, Toby, do you want to talk about how that arrangement works? Yep, sure. So um, Willigan and Dumby both have carbon projects on their lands. Uh, they've had them since 2015, I think. So that's what, uh, six years they've been running a carbon program. There are a few others in the North Kimberley. Um, most of you probably know how it works, but essentially you, um, you have a set amount of fuel on the ground and if you burn it early in the year, you, you emit a certain amount of carbon and if you, it burns late in the year, it, it emits much more carbon. So if you do more early rather than it burning late, then the difference between what you typically in the past would have admitted you can sell. So that works really well for the, uh, land that's in subtropics and tropics where there's lots of grass growing and you have a big difference. You can shift, you can change the emissions by a large amount, but as you come further south, sort of down into where Mornington is, for instance, that shift is really small. So, so the, the Aboriginal properties that we're in partnership with up north, they have mainly subtropics and tropics rainfall on their properties. So they have big fire programs and AWC does their burning, but they, um, they receive the entire benefit of the carbon program. And then on AWC properties here in the Kimberley, we don't have any, but there's three potential ones sort of going through the motions at the moment, getting set up. And there's also Wongalar in the NT has one. That's Is right. that right, yeah. Joey? And Across Northern Australia, we've got similar prescribed burning programs. And in fact, the, the total area over which AWC is involved in some sort of prescribed burning is about seven and a half million hectares. So that's across the Kimberley, the top end and the northern half of Queensland. Uh, we've got carbon credit schemes in place at Wangalara and Piccaninny Plains this year. So through that work, we're also generating a, a small income from carbon credits there. Uh, another question now from Peter Sainsbury. So uh, Peter, we'll just get your microphone unmuted um, and you can ask that directly. Uh, just a minute while we unmute. Okay, you should be able to fire away. Yeah, good, seems unmuted. Thanks, Joey, thanks, Toby. Th this is a genuine question. I'm not pushing a line here. I'm just interested, it's interested me for a while, you know, uh, in evolutionary terms, 60,000 years is nothing, so most of our ecology evolved long before modern humans or any humans arrived in Australia um, and it evolved, co evolved over that period. So, so I'm not quite sure what the arguments are to justify fire management, even using indigenous practices. We surely we are changing the, the natural ecology in, in which for, flora and fauna evolved up to 60,000 years ago. So I'm just interested, what, what are the moral or practical arguments in favour of doing what we're doing? Yeah, that's a, a fascinating question. Um, I think, you know, there, there are seminal books like Tim Flannery's uh, The Future Eaters, which describes the shifts that have happened in the Australian landscape, um, not only since people have been here, but even before that. And I think most people would agree that there have been significant shifts in the ecology since people arrived, whether that was 80,000 or 100,000 years ago. And one of the big changes is that the megafauna, the large giant species of marsupials, diprotodons and things like that went extinct. And that meant that we are missing that, um, that component of large herbivores. Some people argue that fire in some ways took on the role of Australia's large herbivore. So, you know, it consumes vegetation, it emits carbon dioxide. So, you know, there's an argument that fire plays a disproportionate role in Australia since people got here because those megafauna went extinct. Um, 
even if you're just looking at maintaining the status quo, we know that without doing active fire management, uh, following traditional methods or, or more you know, contemporary means, um, we know what happens to native species, they decline. And we've seen a number of extinctions or declines which can be attributed to not doing, you know, the lack of fire management in the north. So I would argue that there's, you know, there's no real option for excluding fire from Northern Australia's landscape. It just doesn't work. There's so much growth, there's so much fuel on the ground after the wet season that you can choose when to burn, you can choose the type of fire, but excluding fire isn't an option. And we know that that has disastrous results for native wildlife. Anything to add, Toby? Yeah. Um, I was just having a look to see if I had any data on that. But um, no, I, I sort of agree with you, Joey. Like everything's constantly changing. Like, and, and the way we like to do the work we're doing is we're actually looking at the outcome first, what we're trying to achieve, and then we're working back from there. So, you know, Gordian finches were nearly extinct across all of Northern Australia. And that was found to be because of the way that fire was being managed historically. All the ranges were being burnt out. There was no grass that was getting left over for the um, granivorous birds to kind of subsist on through the hottest part of the year in October, November, December. And so, like, if we continued in the same way of just kind of neglecting to participate in managing fire, then there'd most likely be no more Gouldian finches, for instance. And once we introduce cats, we introduce a new problem, you know, and so then we have to, again, go and look at the outcome that we're trying to attain and work backwards from there. So we're not putting fire into the landscape because we like to or we think it's the most enjoyable way to kind of do fire or, or however you want to put it. It's more about the outcome that we're trying to achieve and then working back from there. So like having a really good intent is where we begin from. And then we manipulate the fire program on a large scale to try and get that outcome everywhere. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, a good summary. Um, we've just had a, another follow-up question here. About <laughs> Thanks, Peter. <laughs> um, so a, a question, about, do they create waste in the bushland? So, you know, they're, they're little capsules that we're dropping. You're dropping a, a fair number of them. What happens to them once they're on the ground? They burn. Right. Um, Maybe uh, people here would know of like Condi's crystals, potassium permanganate. That's essentially what's inside this capsule. And, and when you inject it with glycol, radiated coolant, it combusts. So the material inside these things is there to sustain a fire for about a minute. So it drops from the chopper or the plane or however you're throwing it out the door or off the back of a car. It hits the ground and after 40 seconds it combusts and starts the fire. So there's pretty much nothing left by the end of it. Cool. Um, okay, another question here. So this is from John Gerardi. Um, John will unmute you so you can ask it directly. Um, Thank okay, you. Okay, fire away. Uh, this is um, evoked uh, pleasant memories of a time I visited Charnley exactly this time last year. <laughs> Uh, it's very good. My question is um, just the your relationship and the relationship of the fire burning program to neighbours and um, to pastoralists in the general area. Toby, do you want to talk about how we collaborate with neighbouring properties and pastoralists? Um, well, we do all their burning, I guess is the simplest way to say it. So um, can you put up that map again, Joey? Is that easy? Yeah, just a second. So, so we have um, partnership arrangements with Willigan Aboriginal Corporation and Dumbi Mungari Aboriginal Corporation, which are in the, in, you can see them marked there. And then Yampi is a partnership with Defence. And then the green property, Tableland, that's also a partnership with Yulumbu Aboriginal Corporation. But all that white hashed area is EcoFire, which is the original fire project that started in the Kimberley in 2005. And they are all pastoral stations. So we do all the pastoral station work in the central Kimberley pretty much and we've done it since 2007. So generally we have a really good relationship with all our neighbours um, and, and also the parts of the Kimberley that aren't um, sort of outlined with boundaries for you there, 
they're primarily either um, done by the Kimberley Land Council, so they're Aboriginal lands, similar to Dumby and Willigan, or they are national parks. So we do almost all the, um, all the pastoral stations. I think there's 12 pastoral stations that we do as part of Ecofire. Right, and that's working in collaboration with the landholders to come up with a plan that suits their, uh, you know, their priorities for fire management as well as improving ecological health yeah. more broadly. Great. Yeah, and typically in a, in a normal year, they would be flying with us while we're delivering the program, but just because of COVID, we're, we're, we're doing it independently this year. But yeah, typically we're working with them all the time. Great. All right, the next question is from Dave Monday. Dave will unmute you so you can ask your question. Okay, okay go ahead. Thanks, Joey. Thanks, Joey. Um, basically, uh, given traditional owners burn in a lot of reasons is uh, to, for green pick afterwards for, for hunting and, um, and for other reasons, I was just curious to see how does the birding program integrate into the Kimberley um, feral management or feral animal management program, with, um, particularly with donkeys and, and feral cattle? Toby? Sure, oh, sorry, I'm just gonna, helicopter coming over. Um, uh, I'm just gonna have to lean in. Uh, the, the feral donkey program, just one sec, sorry. Did you um, see that Toby or was that just happening? No, no, <laughs> maybe a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, we did a research project at Mornington about four years ago that we dubbed CARF. And that was to look at maybe not um, feral herbivores so much, but it was, well, it was to inform how we manage feral herbivores, but it was more to look at how cattle, farm cattle interacted with fire. And we found things like if you burn within two kilometers of water courses, every single cow within four kilometers will come and stay on that scar uh, uh, and like persist on that scar until they die sometimes if there's no rain. So we modified our fire programs to try and avoid burning too close to waterways for that reason. Um, but in terms of the feral management, it's, it, it, I know, yeah, not, not a huge amount. The one thing we have done before is burnt areas specifically to draw cattle in to remove them uh, when we're trying to destock areas and things like that. But uh, the donkey program is is sort of it, 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 the the fire program doesn't impact how the donkeys seem to behave anyway. Just um, to add, sort of very, it's not, no, that's right. Just to add to that, um, you know, we have looked at how fire uh, interacts with other threats to wildlife, and one of the really important papers that came out last year, based on thirteen years of monitoring at Mornington, was that the gains we see in small mammal abundance when you get fire management right are only apparent in areas that have been destocked. So, you know, we've got these different levers we can pull to improve ecological health. Fire is a really big one, but reducing feral animals and, and destocking areas is another one. And that's where you get the best results, at least for small mammal populations. So, you know, it's, it's typical of AWC's approach. We're looking at the whole landscape and trying to manage it holistically, taking into account those interactions. Most of you will also be familiar with uh, the feral cat study led by Hugh McGregor at Mornington, uh, which showed very clearly that big hot fires actually make it easier for cats to hunt uh, small mammals and ground dwelling birds. So there's a whole lot of science being generated by the team at Mornington um, who are currently writing up a lot of their analysis from the last couple of years, um, which demonstrates the, the benefits to biodiversity of, of this sort of work. All right, I think we've run out of time. So thank you to everyone who has tuned in and uh, a great number of questions that have come in. If you do have other questions that you'd like to uh, have us address, please send us a message or an email and we'll get back to you. So we're, we're happy to continue the conversation. Uh, Toby, thanks so much for tuning in from Charnley. Um, I've just got one more photo of the team on the ground there, and we should formally acknowledge the work that we're doing with Dumpy Mangyari and Willigan Aboriginal Corporations. Um, I think you get a sense just from talking to the team up there today of the scale of this work, 
it really is a massive operation being delivered by a dedicated small team based in a very remote location and you know isolated for what will be over two months up there so a really impressive feat and toby congratulations to you and the team for all the work that you're you're doing up there i'd appreciate everyone dialing in so i'm not talking to myself anymore <laughs> there we go a bit of uh, socializing for your thursday morning <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Next week, we're checking in with Graham and Sal, our sanctuary managers at Piccaninny Plains up on Cape York. Um, so if you've got any questions for what life is like uh, in isolation, living on the Cape, uh, please send them to us uh, beforehand and we'll try and incorporate them. We've also just posted the link to register for next week's webinar in the chat. So if you haven't received the invite or you just want to make sure that you've registered click on the link that's appeared in the Zoom chat now uh, and just go through the registration process there. Toby, thanks again. Um, everyone else, we'll see you next time.